Hello everyone and thanks for joining us for this session and I'm very thankful to Kyaw Parkinson to give me this opportunity to talk about alpha senutrin. But before starting talking about alpha senutrin, I would like to mention the historical facts. I know Dr. Simon all, already mentioned the history, but I would like to mention again this year 1997 because this year marked a major milestone in the knowledge and understanding of Parkinson disease. Almost 26 years since alpha synuclein became the center of the research of Parkinson disease. So as Dr. Simon mentioned that uh, in this year two major uh, discoveries happened. One uh, that some of the minor forms of Parkinson disease occur due to the mutation in the gene SNCA. That gives a hint that alpha synuclein is one of the signature for the development of Parkinson disease. And the another fact he mentioned about UV bodies, and in this year, it was discovered <laughs> that this alpha synuclein is one of the component of navy bodies. So this year gives us an idea that alpha synuclein may be one of the promising markers for the diagnosis of Parkinson disease. So what is alpha synuclein? I will talk about this. So for now, I'm assuming that not all of us are conversant with molecular biology. So I will share some basic Text. What is alpha synuclein? So, as we have all heard about the proteins, the proteins are made up of amino acids. So, alpha synuclein is a protein which is composed of 140 amino acids, and these amino acids present in a sequence, and this sequence has three different sections, and these three sections. Uh, affect the function of alpha synuclein in some ways. And in a normal uh, state, alpha synuclein, these 140 amino acids form a three dimensional structure, as you can see here, is called monomer. Monomer is basically the normal form of alpha synuclein, which you can find in a cell where these monomers are just sitting, doing, uh, I mean, these monomers do not uh, cause any harm to the cell. So as someone asked the question, what is the normal function of uh, the nuclein? But it's very difficult yeah, to uh, mention or to pinpoint that it is the normal function. But this monomer as a native form or in a normal state leads uh, participate in the communication between neurons and it also participates in the release of a neurotransmitter called dopamine that plays important role in the maintenance of uh, like motor functions, uh, coordination and balances, etc. So this is one of the known function of alpha synuclein in a normal state. So alpha synuclein is rich in mono, uh, rich in neurons, and it is a very a uh, dynamic protein that can acquire different shapes, different structures, and exhibit different functions. So uh, if we, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, this is the native form of alpha synuclein, which is unfolded, which is not toxic in nature. But sometimes there is some changes in the cell environment. For example, changes in the ions content, pH, and sometimes these monomers may interact. Sometimes two of these interact and form dimers. Sometimes four of these couple together and form tetramer. But that's totally fine because these are normal. These are not doing any harm to the cell. And side by side, neurons have, uh, like, for the maintenance of its well-being, neuron is efficiently... Um, equipped with a lot of uh, recycling system. So I will share a few of, the, a few of these mechanisms, how the uh, neuron maintains the normal level of synuclein. So for example, in the neuron, there are chaperons, proteasomes, and microglia. And these systems 
uh, degrade the excess amount of senuclein or excess amount of dimers or tetramers. And in that way, neuron maintain its well-being and balances the level of senuclein. But somehow, we don't know the exact reason. We are still working on that to find out the mechanism. But sometimes the problem occurs and these recycling system may compromise and there is reduced number of uh, chaperons or proteasomes and then these monomers become abundant in the neurons and start to interact with each other to form long uh, dense structures which we call oligomers and these oligomers uh, can tend to form even more rigid, uh, more densely packed structure, which we call protofibrils, because there are compromised uh, recycling or degradation system in the neurons due to some reasons. So these pro protofibrils continue to interact with each other and form very large fibrils with misfolded structures and what we call these as fibrils. And these fibrils are actually toxic in nature. So this diagram is showing how the things can happen and how the normal form of senuclein converts to a toxic form, fibril. And these fibrils start to occupy large spaces in the neurons. And in some of the cases of Parkinson disease, these fibrils accumulate and form levy body. So these are... Uh, the ways how the monomers convert to fibril and can contribute to the development of Parkinson disease. So I, uh, one of the target of Parkinson disease research is to uh, reduce these uh, toxic forms of senuclein. And yes, here, here at VAI, we are also working continuously to find ways in order to slow down the progression and development of Parkinson disease so for that, one of our aim is to detect alpha synuclein. Is this protein available only in brain or there are some other possible sites where we can uh, have these synuclein? So what are the possible ways for detection? So I think I will stop here and I would like to call Dr. Erazanis because he is working on the different methods for the detection of alpha synuclein. All right. Uh, my name is Ahaz Anis. I'm also a researcher working at the Green Front in the Barnsley Plan Animal Institute. And I'll talk about how alpha synuclein is detected. So in the lab, uh, one of the most common and most powerful things that we have to detect proteins, in this case alpha synuclein, is antibodies. And that can be used in a variety of ways, but I'll talk about some relevant techniques that we use. So the first one is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay which is also called ELISA. As scientists like to give catchy names to everything. That's ELISA. Uh, it's called enzyme link because uh, the reaction that happens that gives us the output, the signal, it is catalyzed by an enzyme. And this tells us if there's any alpha synuclein in our sample. Then there's immunoblotting, which is also called Western blotting. This is a way to visualize how much protein there is in our sample. And it gives us bands, which you can see here. Uh, on a specific kind of membrane, it blots onto that. And based on the thickness of the band, we can estimate how much alpha synuclein is present in that sample. And then there's immunofluorescence, which gives us these wonderful fluorescent images. Um, and it helps us localize exactly where alpha synuclein is. Because as you can see, it's staying single cells, uh, the neurons in this case. There's also immunohistochemistry, which works in a similar fashion, but does not involve any fluorescence. Uh, in the clinic, what are the ways to detect alpha synuclein easily? Unfortunately, right now there are none. Any widespread, commonplace techniques that can be used to detect alpha synuclein, which is why we're excited about a technique called seed amplification assay. Um, this is a relatively new technique. It's based on an older technique, which was called protein misfolding cycling, cyclic amplification assay. It has been adapted to detect alpha synuclein in this case. And what this does is this allows for early detection. Parkinson's. Uh, it's also highly sensitive, so very few false negatives, and it's also highly specific, which means very few false positives. So let's talk about the principle of seed amplification assay. But before we get into that, I'd like to um, go
go over this again. I know Dr. Simon Zemir wonderfully explained how the protein misfolds alpha-synuclein. But just for context, uh, the monomer, which is basically alpha-synuclein in its native state, it's soluble. The monomer word uh, literally means molecule, and they can come together to form a larger molecule of repeating nature. That's where the word comes from. And uh, under certain conditions, it comes together, it forms an oligomer, and oligomer aggregates further to form a protofibril, and that further aggregates. Yeah. Now, what's interesting here is uh, there's evidence that the fibril is possible. Uh, uh, it's, it has an ability to convert the monomers further into the misfolded uh, forms or the abnormal form of the protein alpha synuclein. So it kind of turns into a cycle at this point. Uh, so seed amplification assay, which was up until recently called real-time quaking-induced conversion, you'll see why it was called that in a minute. Uh, so for seed amplification assay, we need seeds. Uh, what can be the seed source? It can be any biospecimen from, a, from an individual we suspect would have the ab abnormal form of alpha synuclein, the pathogenic form, and then that can be our source for the misfolded, the pathogenic form of alpha synuclein. This comes together in a reaction with the substrate, which would be the normal form of the protein, the monomer form, the native form. And when they interact with each other, uh, that causes the conversion of the normal form into the abnormal form. So it turns into a pathogenic form. Uh, and when that happens, they start to spontaneously aggregate. And at this point in the reaction, if there's certain chemical that, then, that can help us detect uh, that aggregation is happening, it could give us a signal, we can read that output. And further down the line, if we shake this vigorously, which is done by a machine at a specific uh, speed, uh, it's also called quaking, that's where the name comes from, it can break down into new seeds. So these new seeds can, again, start the cycle and keep this process going. So we exploit this particular ability of the fibril to induce conversion of uh, the normal protein into abnormal protein to uh, in the lab to detect uh, misfolded forms of alpha-synuclein. What can be the different biospecimens that can be used as a seed source, as a source of the pathogenic form of alpha synuclein? It can be cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, uh, which is uh, minimally invasive, but it's a little painful. There's a blood draw, which is, again, minimally invasive. There's a skin sample, which can be done by a um, biopsy punch. And then there's nasal brushings. There's uh, saliva samples. And there's biopsy tissue samples. So all of these have been validated in seed amplification assays. Some have performed better than the others. From what I can remember, in a recent study, it was found that PSF and skin samples have fared better than the other samples. Uh, so what we use seed amplification assay in the lab for, we are specifically focused on a little organ called the vermiform appendix. Um, it's a tiny worm-like structure attached. It's a hollow tube attached to the end of the large intestine. Uh, why we're focused on this, uh, a group published a paper some years ago where they found there was a correlation between undergoing appendectomy, which is removal of your appendix, and lowering of the incidence of Parkinson's disease. So we're trying to look at a molecular level what's happening, trying to decipher what, what, what is in the appendix that could be the cause of this. So we use the appendix samples, we turn it into a slurry, a uh, liquid form, a lysate, and that serves as our source of the pathogenic alpha synuclein. Now we do this reaction in a 96 well plate, which is basically a plate this big. It has 96 little wells that we can use for individual reactions. So if we need, we can do 96 separate reactions in this one plate. And uh, in this single well goes the seed, which is the pathogenic form of alpha synuclein. We also create uh, the normal form of the protein alpha synuclein in the lab. And when it's made in the lab, it's called recombinant alpha synuclein. That goes into the reaction. Uh, then we need a reaction mixer, which is basically a mix of certain chemicals, which we need to create the perfect conditions for this reaction. And finally, it's thioflavin T, which is a dye that gives us a signal that, that yes, uh, aggregation is happening. You can read it. Now, uh, once that is ready, the plate goes into an equipment called the plate reader. Um, and once aggregation starts happening, we get an output that looks something like this. So you see here the blue curve is a sample from an individual with, with uh, Parkinson's disease. The green one is a sample from an individual who is healthy. So when we analyze these curves based on the differences, we can clearly see that one of them comes from a 
from a sample that has significant amounts of aggregated alpha-synuclein that's pathogenic. So the higher the curve, the better the signal. That means more aggregation is happening here. So uh, I'd like to summarize by saying we are very excited about seed amplification assay. It's a very important technique, and we think it can potentially change the diagnostic landscape in the near future. Uh, I'll leave you with this statistic. Um, in a recent study that was published in Lancet Neurology in 2023, it involved 1,123 participants, um, and they were recruited from all over the world. 33 different neurology practices were involved. Uh, alpha synuclein seed amplification assay was able to detect uh, par early Parkinson's 87.7% of the time. And uh, in the patients who did not have Parkinson's, it was able to detect a lack of the pathogenic forms 96.3% of the time. So yeah, that's pretty good statistics for a validation study. Um, that is all I have. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.